Welcome to the Twimmel AI Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. All right, everyone. I am here with Ruman Chowdhury. Ruman is a managing director and global lead of responsible AI at Accenture. Ruman, welcome to the Twimmel AI Podcast. Thank you for having me, Sam. This has been a few years in the making, and I'm glad we were able to do this. You know what? It only takes a global pandemic to make this conversation happen. <laughs> you know, these are the best conversations, I think, when I'm finally able to connect with uh, with friends and, you know, folks I know from the industry. And you and I in particular, I think I've been trying to make this conversation happen for, as you said, a few years. And it's always, oh, well, I'm going to be in Asia. I'm not in the Bay Area. And <laughs> we, we haven't quite been able to to make it happen. So I'm super, super, super excited me too. Uh, Me to, too. To get this one going, let's uh, start out as we usually do here on the show, and have you share a little bit about your background. You work in ethical and responsible AI. How did you come into into that field? I do, uh, and the answer to that is a lot of meandering. Uh, <laughs> so, by background, I'm a data scientist and a social scientist. Um, I would officially say I'm a quantitative social scientist. Um, I have degrees in political science, management, economics, uh, masters in quantitative methods. But is that PhD. one degree or like five or six? <laughs> Multiple undergrad degrees. <laughs> oh, I know folks like you. <laughs> Um, but I, I moved to Silicon Valley in 2013 to pursue a job in this like weird little field called data science, um, which I had heard about anecdotally while in my PhD program at UCSD. Everyone thought I was crazy. Nobody understood why I was leaving a political science PhD program to do some weird tech job. Um, but here we are seven years later um, with data science and anything related to data science and AI being the only thing people talk about. Um, so after my stint as a data scientist, I was actually teaching data science at a boot camp called Metis, and that's when Accenture found me. Um, I was doing talks on um, polling and the elections and, and in the sense of how numbers and statistics can be misleading uh, because I have a background in things like survey design, polling, and quantitative human behavior analysis. Um, and, you know, Accenture was, this was about three years ago, looking for someone to lead this weird thing called responsible AI. Uh, and that's how, that's how, uh, uh, that's how I got this job. Oh, wow. And what is the Metis, the thing you're doing with Laura? Um, no, that was something else. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, interesting, interesting. And so you've been at Accenture how long now? Three years, I actually hit the three year mark in early February. Wow. Nice. Nice. Which, which in the responsible AI world makes me ancient. <laughs> Absolutely ancient. <laughs> and you're based in San Francisco. How have things been going for you with uh, shelter in place and COVID and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, fortunately, San Francisco had a really good response and people, you know, stayed at home and they more or less have been listening. Uh, I think everyone's just getting a little bit antsy. So I see more and more people out, although people are still being careful. Fortunately, it's been pretty quiet. I live in Mission Bay, which is near the UCSF hospitals. Um, and, you know, it hasn't been that bad. Uh, I though, Fortunately, I live in a really walkable neighborhood. There's parks nearby, et cetera. So it hasn't been overly unpleasant. I just think this is also the shortest, uh, sorry, the longest amount of time I have ever spent uh, not flying somewhere in the uh -huh. past few years. So it's kind of been nice. Yeah, I've commented to, to, in fact, just earlier today, like by this time on a normal year, I'd have been probably to half a dozen at least conferences, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. if not, if not a dozen. It's and you probably would have been around the world a couple times. By oh, now, for right? sure. I mean, it's funny because I have all these placeholders on my calendar and one by one, they all got dropped. But, you know, uh, by now I, I would have been in London twice, India um, and uh, the Nordics. Actually, this week I was supposed to be doing a tour of different Nordic countries to visit different uh, Accenture offices and client partners. And then in a month I was supposed to be in Atlanta uh, I still have this thing in Singapore that apparently is still on the calendar for August, but I think they're being ambitious at this point. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, uh, 
it's nice to be home. You know, it's nice to be around my my pets and organize my apartment and do all those things that one does not get to do. <laughs> nice. So, uh, what are you up to at uh, there at Accenture? You know, mm-hmm. in responsible AI. What does that What does that mean? What is Accenture's role in responsible AI, and and how do you help uh, fulfill that? Yeah, so I have a I have a really interesting and still unique job. Although I hope that there will be more jobs that are like mine. Um, my job is to actually provide and create practical client solutions around responsible and ethical use of artificial intelligence. And this can mean anything from data ethics to the uh, unpacking of the black box, as a lot of people call it, or just understandability and models, um, even to like the, the strategic organizational structure of companies and, and how do you create a governance infrastructure. Um, and it's been really fascinating because, as I said, like I got this job through meandering, but uh, What's fascinating is, is in this job, I use every degree I've ever had, every part of my brain. Um, so, you know, while I do have to tap into my data science skills and think about model explainability, interpretability, different ways of doing data assessments, et cetera, I tap into my social science brain all the time. And I think about human behavior and human responses and how to construct something so that, you know, we're getting accurate data or or we're creating policies that are inclusive or understandable. But then also I go to companies and we help them redesign their organizational infrastructure to create the right kind of scaffolding to enable responsible AI. And actually um, I've been working with some folks and we have a paper coming out quite soon. We did a um, workshop at FACT, formerly known as FACTSTAR. I've been working with a researcher of mine, uh, Bogdana Rakova, um, Henry Kramer from Spotify Labs and uh, Jin Ying Yang. Oh, I'm a huge fan of Henry. I haven't yeah. seen her in <laughs> Oh, because she's super busy even in the <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> she, another conversation just like this. Oh, maybe yeah. I should reach out to her and say, hey, are you, uh, you know, you non pandemic busy or something? <laughs> <clears throat> We're sort of non-pandemic busy, but uh, for sure, similar to me, she's on planes less, so that's good. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, so we so part of my job is the technical deployment, and there's a bit uh, there's a part of it that's also about the organizational structure and the strategic deployment, because a big part of the public simply understanding what you're doing with AI is to uh, improve how we communicate what this technology can and cannot do, because there's a lot of hype, there's a lot of noise, and frankly, there's a lot of backlash to the hype. There's even ethics hype now, frankly. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I apologize, I got excited when you said Henriette, what was the paper about? (laughs) You're like, who paper, what? Henriette. Um, no, it's fine. So the paper was really interesting because we're we're at this phase in responsible AI or ethics where there are principles, like there are so many principles, we're drowning in principles, right? Uh, Algorithm Watch keeps this database. I think right now they have 150 plus principles of AI and ethics from organizations like the OECD down to companies like Telefonica or even Accenture. Uh, um, and when and you it, say 150 principles, are these 150 kind of published frameworks by mm-hmm. some group or company or 150 yep. if you want to be ethical you need to do things one through 150 i uh, got it uh no so 150 different sets of principles so different okay. organizations that have come up but to your point interestingly there have been uh, a few papers trying to understand what are common themes across principles so like a meta-analysis so anna jobin has one luciano floridi and josh Cowles have another and there are some themes that are pretty common i can't remember them all off the top of my head but stuff like non-malfeasance non-malfeasance and uh you know you know there's like sort of five or six common themes um that floridi and Cowles find so it's it's interesting so to your point Everyone's talking about it, but there are common themes to it in general. And the big thing now is how do we drive principles into action? How do we do stuff with this? And our paper was about how do you enable the the right sort of organizational structure? So drawing from, like I said, I use every part of my brain, drawing from like management literature, thinking through uh, organizational analysis, organizational structure. Um, how, How do we draw from those principles? to understand the kinds of shifts companies need to make to enable the people they've hired to institute responsible AI. So it, we, we did um, hour-long surveys with 24 different people across 18 different companies. And we specifically focused on people like myself who are 
there for the application, not just the research. Um, and, you know, like found a lot of really, really interesting things. Mm, interesting. Yeah. I, in fact, the last time I reached out to Henriette was in advance of uh, our conference, Twimol's mm -hmm. conference in the fall. Um, and we did a panel on operationalizing AI ethics. So, yeah. you know, for organizations yeah. that are, you know, trying to implement AI and do it responsibly, you know, what are some of the things that, um, that they could do? And, you know, we got into this long back and forth email conversation about how it's all evolving. <laughs> and, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, and that's actually what the paper is about. It's about how we're in this critical um, uh, inflection point where there, there's this, so there's this whole organizational, organizational literature about external and internal pressures in organizations that enable ethical change. And right now we have a significant amount of external pressure and it's all just like, so it just takes time, right? We just have to do the things. And it took a while for the community to evolve, for people to make principles, people to start talking about them, the, you know, the media engagement, public awareness. And now it's reached this point where companies are getting this pressure. And we also have internal champions and companies trying to drive this change. So, you know, how, how can we utilize this internal and external, this ex external pressure to enable the internal champions to do their job and what can companies do to help them? Um, but yeah, absolutely. It's all, it, you know, so we look at the current state, which, which is kind of where things are today, the prevalent state, which is, you know, uh, in the immediate future, where, where are things likely to go? And then this ideal future state, like where would people love things to be in the future? What is this ideal state of a responsible company? Interesting. Interesting. For a while, I would hear about organizations that were taking this position that, you know, we're just not going to pursue AI because it's too ethically fraught and we don't know what to do. Do you see that? at all? Or had you seen that? Is it still something that you come across? Um, well, for I have definitely seen that sentiment when it comes to individual projects. I think every, every company is really excited about the promise of AI. And mm -hmm. I don't think anybody is turning down, you know, the whole concept in general. I mean, frankly, like, you, you just won't be you a market leader. Yeah, you, right. you kind of can't. Um, however, yes, I have seen hesitation when it came to implementing, when it comes to implementing certain projects. And it's definitely a blocker in companies scaling AI. Um, one thing we find uh, in general as, as a company, as Accenture, um, you know, there are many blockers to scaling artificial intelligence. Companies are drowning in proof of concept. Anybody can spin up a proof of concept based on a nice database. They find, you know, some sort of online data, do some fancy neural net on it. You can have data science spin something up in three weeks. But productionalizing it, scaling it is a whole other endeavor. Yeah. And so part of you, you, you've kind of talked about all these different parts of your brain that come in, into mm -hmm. play when trying to help organizations think through this. Mm -hmm. um, do, do most organizations already have the kind of pieces in place to build, a, um, you know, to build ethics into the way they operationalize machine learning? Like if you're in, you know, financial services, for example, you know, you've had to deal with, you know, making loan decisions ethically and, mm -hmm. um, you know, things like that. So you probably have some kind of organizational, some governance structure in place. Uh, to what extent did most, you know, or how prevalent is that? And and what are the things, even if you have that, that you need to do to, to make it make sense in the context of ML and AI? Yeah, that's a really great question. And the answer is it just varies a lot. And some of it is the culture of the organization or the company. And some of it is just the nature of the industry that it's in. Um, I would say my my rule of thumb for, you know, thinking through which companies are, you know, would be the most successful at enabling responsible AI, at least at this point, um, one would be uh, understanding AI output as probabilistic and not deterministic. So understanding the math and statistics behind it, um, rather than thinking of it as a magical computational outcome, just helps someone in my position a lot because a lot of the bias and unfairness from artificial intelligence arises from the fact that, you know, if you understand that, this, that, that the output is a likelihood and not a certainty, then you can appreciate bias in, you know, in, in a almost like a technical sense, the way data scientists think about bias. Um, and then you can appreciate how bias can enter in a system 
and think of you know how to remove that bias. Um, uh, second would be some sort of adoption of uh, you know use of AI in your organization already. It's difficult if you're um, again like you think this is like some sort of magical technology. Uh, the third, interestingly, is either develop legal functions or regulated industry, and not just because of external pressures like regulators, but um, companies that are in industries that are highly regulated have legal functions that are already dedicated. They've already started building that infrastructure. So if I were to talk to a company um, you know, in, in a less regulated industry, their lawyers are usually more like contract lawyers or you know, certain types of or maybe like litigation lawyers, but they haven't had to actually work with ethics and compliance necessarily and, and not necessarily in that developed of a sense. Um, although I, I really do think this notion of, of risk functions and the value of something like a chief risk officer is going to uh, change quite a bit. And that role will be increasingly valuable, um, you know, as as we adopt more artificial intelligence. So to your point about financial services, they're my favorite customers <laughs> in, in the sense that like, I mean, they're ready like, to, they're, they're ready to roll, she... like they get it. Also, yeah. I mean, so marginal amount of bias, like, because I'm a statistician also by background, like, you know, like I, I think a lot of, um, Anecdotally, I'll say a lot of statisticians who work at these financial services organizations got a little bit marginalized by the rise of data science because people did not, because again, it was sort of sold as this magical computer thing, not a bunch of math. And these statisticians are like, no, we've been doing this for a long time. And I wholeheartedly agree. They have been doing this for a long time. So they understand models. They understand how to assess them. They understand that accuracy isn't the only thing to look at when you look at models, um, you know, and this notion of testing. It's all like they, they get all of it. Uh, but also the industry itself has this culture of ethics that comes about post the 2008 financial crisis. And this really interesting document uh, called SR 117. And it was written by the Federal Reserve in, on my birthday in 2011. And if you were to read that document, you would be like, it, it reads as if like someone like you or me wrote this today about the issues with models, the need for ethical use, um, irresponsible use of data and appropriate use of models. It's fascinating because they were thinking about this 10 years ago and there's, there's a lot we can learn. And certainly artificial intelligence introduces new challenges, but the building blocks are there. But in it, And it's probably the most robust in financial services than anywhere else. Hmm. Yeah, I think when I think about ethics and one of the challenges of, you know, just trying to address it you know, organizationally, it, it's, I guess I can characterize it as like, you've got this, this one side that's like idealistic and this mm -hmm. another side that's kind of very practical. And I'm wondering, you know, do we lose something when we kind of hand over this concept of ethics to lawyers and risk management people? Um, I think that there is an evolution of the risk function that's probably going to happen. And you're right. When I think about this work, I try to broaden the phrase to be about risk and impact. Um, and, and I do agree there's a cynical take on risk, which is more about, you know, how do we, how do we get as, as close to the line as possible? Yeah, or, or also like, yeah, risk as not liability. Um, yeah. But I will say working with a lot of folks who are in this field, um, I think there is this desire. So, you know, going back to financial services, a lot of this, a lot of what exists today is model risk management started from uh, this conference, this, this gathering called Basel, and it was Basel 1, 2, 3, like these different mm -hmm. documents. And it's not just about, like, here's how you audit a model. It's actually about how do you make an ethical company? They thought about things like compensation mm -hmm. for employees being linked to performance, which would then create incentives for them to either misrepresent or lie about what's going on, right? And not to say it's been perfect. I mean, <laughs> there have been some notable disasters since then. Um, but the, the intent is there. And maybe this is, you know, a, a good motivator for, for the people who are truly dedicated. Um, but you're right. I, I, I like to expand the language to move beyond risk to impact. I think impact is more proactive. I think impact uh, thinks more broadly. And impact also isn't focused on like, how do we shift the liability from me to someone else? Because theoretically, in a pure risk function, I can just say like, well, my organization's risk is X. And if that person's absorbing the risk, then my risk is lowered. That doesn't mean that people didn't get harmed. It just means I'm not being sued, right? That's a, a very, that's a more cynical take. But, but then bringing in the language of impact, 
um, broadens it to mean like, no, you are actually socially responsible to, you know, the, the environment at large, whether it's the market, whether it's society or, or your customers. Mm. So if you're an organization that is kind of down the path of uh, exploring machine learning, maybe you have, you know, one or N of these prototypes that you, mm-hmm. you've you mentioned and you're um, starting to operationalize uh, ML technically and you're listening to this interview and you're like, oh, ethics, I need to, I need to, <laughs> I need to get me some that. of that. I need to get me some <laughs> of that. <laughs> what, you know, maybe, you know, you know, first of all, kind of what do you do there? But also, you know, I think you mentioned in like thinking about these problems, you kind of, you're using all these different kind of parts of your brain, your management mm-hmm. part of your brain, your social sciences part of your brain, your technical part of your brain. Um, you know, when I think about, you know, kind of me, I've got a little bit of management part of my brain from kind of, you know, industry. I've got a technical part of my brain. But like when I was in school, I went to an engineering school. RPI, go engineers. Oh, yeah. I I took like maybe two social science classes in the whole time. So like there, I don't have that, um, you know, that kind of formal training to, to draw on. And there are a lot of people in industry that don't. So Mm -hmm. how do you, um, you know, what, what is the, the path look like to start to understand, you know, maybe kind of encapsulate the the room on social sciences, you know, brain or what have you. Yeah, um, yeah. So you can really kind of, you know, if not rigorously, thoughtfully think through these kinds of issues and put a structure in place so that you can do it repeatedly and start to scale it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so two thoughts. One is the first talk I ever wrote at Accenture, I actually still give it today. And it's called, what do we talk about when we talk about bias? And uh, what I realized is that when data scientists were communicating with non-data scientists, it was this like lost in translation moment about some of the most basic terms, like bias is one. Mm-hmm. Um, and to your point about you know going to a purely technical school where you didn't really take social science classes, when I was teaching at Metis, I realized that my students that came from pure STEM backgrounds had no concept that data could be biased because you know for them data represented and objective truth. Um, And and I had to, and it's something that we sort of rationally- We never see that argument on Twitter today. (laughs) No, not at all. Never happens. No, never. Uh, But it's interesting because it's sort of anecdotally people get it, but then, you know, and I understand like if you're a computer scientist or a mathematician, you've always optimized to a data set, right? Uh, And explaining to them that the collection of data can be flawed was just like this interesting aha moment. Um, and you know, that, that's where some of my early work on this stuff comes from. And it's still, like, you know, I told you I wrote that talk three, over three years ago at this point. I still give it today. And still people are like, oh, oh, yeah, actually, mm-hmm. that's true. Um, so how, so how, sorry, it's my dog. <laughs> pets are unavoidable in the pen. Pets and, pets and children are unavoidable in the pandemic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've had too many calls with someone's child that really ran in. It was very cute. Uh, it's always uh, very cute. Just earlier today, I was watching the Microsoft Build technical keynote and Scott Hanselman. Do you know Scott? Mm-hmm. Um, he was giving a, you know, longtime kind of blogger inspiration, kind of champion of uh, diversity in tech, all this stuff. Scott out to, sh- uh, shout out to Scott. Mm-hmm. Um, but he was doing his keynote in front of who knows how many, you know, virtual tens of thousands of people. And his kid sneaks into the back of his office. I love it. <laughs> where I he's love recording to steal some toy. <laughs> I, you know what? I love, I love it. It's so humanizing. I it's agree. just like it's like look, life happens. It's fine. We all work. We're not like we're not automatons. Like, you know, we yep. have pets. We have children. We have lives. We're humans. I think it's great. Yeah. Uh, but but to, back to your question, um, you know, I, I I think that there. So if I were if I could reconstruct the world, um, I think data science, much like quantitative finance, frankly should actually have an arm called critical data science, that there should be people Mm. trained in data science field in the art of critiquing data science models. I think it is way too complex, frankly, 
uh, for an individual to just do as an add-on to their everyday project. And also, it's hard to have that level of objectivity when you're auditing your own work, right? Because everybody likes to think they did a good job, and maybe you did, maybe you didn't, and, you know, there are things you would miss. Um, so a large part of like what people are saying when they say how do we institute this like a lot of folks call for things like red teams drawing from like the way security works well mm -hmm. in order to do that you kind of need these these this like third party of people whether it's another organization or whether it's people within your organization but they need to have this like specialized skill set of being able to like assess models for robustness in all sorts of ways right whether it's um how the data was collected to like literally the parameters of the model and even to like where you will be implementing and who it will be used on, whether it is well suited for those individuals, right? Um, so that, that would be my like, if I could change the world, I would add something called critical data science as a, an actual field of study within data science. Um, but for today, uh, you know, I, I think that people sometimes forget that quantitative social sciences scientists exist. And that's literally what we've done, like our, like our whole lives. Uh, and, and it was interesting when I first moved here, like I got a lot of flack for not being a programmer. Uh, and I just did not like. I'm. I always like to say I'm not born of tech. Like, I, yeah. I'm like my. I, I'm. I was not built and created here. I was 33 when I moved here, so I wasn't like this young green kid like learning about how you know places should be. And I'm like, why is everybody so obsessed with programming? And it's just. It, it, it's it, it's obviously a great skill to have, but for me, it was a means. It was one of many skills. I didn't necessarily think it was more valuable than other skills and this, this sort of weird tiering of what's more or less valuable is very odd to me yeah yeah um and then you know like it it, it was interesting because it's you know you certainly get a lot of flack for being a social science scientist in this world but you know now it's a uh, it, it, it it's interesting because all of my quantitative social science skills come into play so you know i, I think one is just bring in more social scientists on your team, you would be amazed and surprised at our level of statistical and quantitative skill and abilities and our programming skills. We can do all of it. Um, but, you know, to be fair, like, there's plenty of things engineers do that I can't do, right? And But the whole goal is to make this an interdisciplinary group. I actually don't think any one group or body can do this. Like I certainly personally cannot do all of it. It's supposed to be my job kind of at a high level, right? The more you dig into it, the more you realize how there's a role for everyone to play. So thinking through, you know, the, the study that I did with like uh, Henriette and Jingying and, and Bobby, that's actually the answer. It's like the entire organization is responsible and everybody has their job to do. And I can appreciate how it's an extremely daunting task if you are a data scientist on a project. You know, there's always this literature with data scientists as if they're gods, as if like, you know, and I remember my first job as a data scientist, like, you're not a god. <laughs> you're responding to someone else's demands. You got to meet <laughs> deadlines, right? I mean, it, it actually takes a pretty brave person to say, you know, we need to put this project on hold because this data is wrong or incomplete or to go to your project manager and say like, you know, this product is not built ethically um, and we need to create the right sort of incentives and, and community structures to do so. It's a very, you know, like I suppose high level answer to your question. So I, I don't have an easy answer to it. I think it's fine that, you know, people are, I think it's, it's totally fine that people are offering ethics, curricula, et cetera. I think it's certainly needed, but is it going to solve the problem? No, it's not. And I think that's a, it's a great point. And you know, one of the biggest things that's changed in data science over the past, you know, three, five or so years is kind of this move away from thinking of the the data scientist as this kind of, you know, lone ninja that kind of roams the night. It was never, that job was never that. Like this whole like weird 10% engineer thing. I'm like, who is that? Who are these? I, I don't know. Like, honestly, I don't know data scientists who are like that. I don't know who these people are. I've certainly never worked with one and, you know, and if they existed, nobody ever liked them, and they were actually never very productive. I remember these like, these pictures that you that we used to see with like the data scientists and like all of the the skills in their backpacks. And, oh God, you, that's right. Do you remember what I'm talking this. about? <laughs> My favorite used to be these job descriptions, and you can still find them. And it'll be like you know, uh, computer science degree, PhD preferred, uh, ten years plus engineering knowledge of like, 
like everything. All of the industry stuff. All and, of it. And I'm like, yeah. this, this person doesn't exist. And like, oh, and then they'll also say something like, you know, back in 2015, it would say like 10, like six to 10 years of experience in data science. I'm like, that term didn't exist 10 years ago, but right. okay. Right. Go back to like Yahoo and go find the like OG data scientist. Maybe one of them is qualified. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, but to your to your point, actually, at at my first job, I one of the their first data science hire was actually somebody from Yahoo who was one of their original data scientists, and like he certainly wasn't that way. He was a really he was a great teacher, a wonderful person to work with. Taught me a lot about how to productionalize code. That was one of the things I didn't know how to do. I I mean, I knew how to like assess models and build it in like this closed environment, but how do you take it and you know make it ready for an engineering team? Though these were skills I didn't have, and and Sajit was really helpful and like a wonderful person to work with. So I have no idea where that weird myth comes from. <laughs> um, interesting, but it, I think by and large organizations with few exceptions have kind of moved away from that towards more of a team approach. Mm -hmm. um, Stitch Fix comes to mind as a counter example mm -hmm. where they are very much, uh, you know, they still look for a full stack data scientist, they call them. But in general, you know, I tend to see more of kind of a team approach that uh, has specialists. And I think to your point, you know, ethics or, you know, computational social science thinking or however we want to call it is a, you know, it's a complementary skill that belongs on that team as opposed to, you know, we have to, you know, make everyone social science ninjas in addition to being technical ninjas and deployment. It's ninjas. actually, it's like, so I guess the, it's one of those things where the field just had to mature, right? Yeah. Uh, and it, the analogy that I always think of is like, remember the title webmaster from the 90s? <laughs> Like, okay, like, like try, try to tell anybody born after the year 2000 that once upon a time, companies would hire one person to manage their website. The whole thing. <laughs> this included graphics, design, awesome. you, so know, you know, what I mean? and now it's, and not only is it a team, it is a team of people who are like graphics designers, like, you know, and pure creative folks, two engineers and programmers, to somebody who's just developing content and really good at, at writing copy and messaging, yeah. you know, and it's, a, and I, again, I think that over time, I mean, it took a while to get there and that that's where it went because it was just logical. You know, our web presence became just as important, if not sometimes more so than a physical presence for any given company. If you wanted to do it right, you had to invest in people. Guess what? With interdisciplinary skill sets, you couldn't just write, you know, this res, this job description of someone who knew HTML, CSS, and, you know, you know, do you know a color palette, you know? <laughs> Just don't make this website in Wingdings ever <laughs> Comic Sans and Wingdings for the win. Oh, man. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, so there's kind of beyond kind of the the ethics you know should we shouldn't we you know not to, to over simplify ethics i guess I'm, I'm i want to transition to kind of explainability and the extent to which that comes up in your work and is a concern for the people that you uh are working with and assuming so you know what are you seeing as kind of the the ways that folks are addressing it yeah it's interesting so the notions of both explainability and transparency come about in part because of a lot of the legislation from the EU, so general data protection regulation. Um, and it's been interesting to see how people interpret it. So like another talk that I give is about both the notion of explainability and transparency. Um, and explain it, like the idea of explaining just the concept of what it means to explain is really interesting, right? So again, like tapping into this other part of my brain. Uh, this is where I draw on like political philosophy and, and, you know, governance and democracy, right? So, you know, we want to create all this governance around AI um, and we want to like explain things, right? But often explainability is this notion that I'm just going to tell you things uh, and somehow you're supposed to understand what I'm saying. So the, the idea would be like this panoptic, like teacher in a lecture hall kind of thing. Like I'm standing in front of a room, I'm putting up these lectures. If you don't get it, it's your fault and you got to figure it out. And, and the, so sometimes like our notion of explainability, because we translate from data science to, you know, other fields, whether it's a, a customer service representative or a loan officer or a judge, right? These are other people who 
have no interest or skills or abilities in our field, same way we don't have any interest, skill or ability in their fields, mm-hmm. right? So what are we, like, how are we explaining things? And, and you know, I suppose a more concrete technical example I use is the, the end user license agreement. So, you know, we've all gone through, we update our OS, and then we get this like long legalese document, <laughs> which none of us read. And even if we sat down and read it, we would not understand it because it's written by lawyers for lawyers. Right. Um, so fully explained, completely explained, not at all understood. Mm-hmm. And often when I think about explainability, I think about the notion of understanding and how, you know, if you're a good teacher, you're really focused on whether or not your students have understood what you've said, right? And, mm-hmm. and even if it means explaining it again or explaining it differently or, you know, you know, taking more effort to understand your audience rather than kind of just saying it the way you would say it. So that would be sort of the, the governance uh, component of it. And and even this notion of transparency, right? So similarly, transparency assumes that if I have a quote transparent process or a transparent model, that I that it's great, that's it, I'm done. Um, there's this, but then there's this assumption there that I can do something about it. And we're not, always, we're, you know, all systems are inherently have a power dynamic. Um, so if a massive tech corporation just says, by the way, we've changed our models to be like X, what are you or I or the average person, be able, would, what would we be able to do? Nothing, right? Absolutely nothing. And this came up quite a bit thinking about like image, like facial recognition, image detection. Um, one pushback I would get from people, you know, on the use of facial recognition in stores, et cetera, to maybe like identify a shoplifter, none of that weird behavioral, you know, uh, like, uh, what is it like via effective computing stuff i just mean like uh-huh. straight up like identifying someone from a video and they would say well what's the difference between that and having a security guard and i'm like well the difference is if there's a security guard and they've unfairly targeted me i can ask who's your like i want to talk to your manager i can call the company i can actually take action but if it is a image recognition system and it incorrectly maps my face to somebody else who is stealing I actually have no agency, I have no form of redress. So I can have full transparency. I know there was facial recognition, I know it was used, but actually I don't have any agency. So this critical missing part of transparency is an agency. But from like a, a technical perspective, I think there's a lot of really cool stuff going on. Like I really love, um, a, a, you know, a, a lot of the, ad, the the way adversarial models are being used to understand model explainability. Um, there are a lot of the, the mimic models, right? Where you have this like, uh, student teacher model. I think there's a lot of mm-hmm. really cool stuff going on there. And I'm, I'm super excited to see more of it being used in production. And like, again, going back to this notion of proof of concept versus production, it's actually really hard to move some of the more advanced models in into a way where a big corporation or even like a medium sized company could use it. Like they're conceptually really interesting, but you know, just like how long it takes to run one of those assessments is sometimes a, a deal breaker to run the model or an assessment of the model because of its um, lack of transparency? Uh, The complexity of an explainability model. Mm -hmm. So some, so for example, like some of the models on, on counterfactual fairness would have to iterate across every single potential scenario that could happen with the data in order to compute uh, what would happen if someone's gender was switched from male to female. Right. Um, those things take a while uh, and maybe it works on if you have like 10 variables, 15 var- variables, it's really hard if you have like 300 variables. Mm-hmm. Um, what, uh, you know, what other interesting things are you seeing happening in the, the field that will kind of, you know, are, are most likely to impact your customers, your clients, you know, the, the, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of conversations happening in the field that kind of range in their practicality and, and pragmatism. And I'm mm-hmm. curious about the, the more pragmatic side of that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> what, like, so like I was like, I started to shop three years ago. I used to have a slide on every single one of my decks, like every single one, I swear, because I just got so tired of it. Uh, I would start every talk by saying there are three things I don't talk about. Mm-hmm. And uh, my three things were Terminator, Hal, and Silicon Valley entrepreneurs saving the world. Uh, because at that time, we had a rosier view of, oh, yeah. But uh, I said every, because like, I swear to God, if someone sucked me into another Hal conversation, I was going to lose my mind. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
Uh, and, so, and so is that is that to say that uh, you know just kind of putting putting pause on the the previous question is that to yeah. say that you don't get involved in like and do, do your customers even care about like the AI safety kinds of questions and um, like paperclip maximizing kinds of questions? Yeah, that yeah kind I of... mean, like maybe for like intellectual curiosity, sure. Right. Um, but you know, and, and I, uh, I think... the paperclip reference for those that are not following is a reference to uh, Peter Bostrom, and I'll we'll drop a uh, an analogy that he get, he gives, and we'll drop a link to my podcast with. Peter, uh, in the show notes. Oh, cool. You did a podcast and that's really awesome. Yeah. Cool. I'm pretty sure we talked about the paperclip thing too. I'd be surprised if you didn't, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> like, I, I mean, I think yes, out of intellectual curiosity, sure. But I don't think, uh, I think we may actually slowly be moving into a scarier world than we were before, particularly with some of the uses of AI and human resources, which is interesting because it's not this like super sexy field. And, oh, yeah, you know, autonomous vehicles. Sort of the, the first field where we're actually addressing some of these like more existential ethical concerns has been in HR because of the rise of effective computing and this concept that you can somehow measure someone's uh, potential by their face or by their expressions or by their manner. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, you know, and, and it's, you know, in retrospect, it's actually not surprising because in when we hire somebody, it is such a, a nebulous and difficult to quantify factor that we hire people on, right? Like sometimes mm-hmm. it's likability, frankly, right? Uh, yep. it, we like to think it's based, and, and even if we're being really rigorous about it, it's often based on potential. And you may have a different interpretation of someone's potential than, than I do. And then, and it's, it's like almost an inherently a biased process. So once we, but yet it is a world in which there's clearly a need for some sort of automation, whether or just in sheer amount of volume that companies have to deal with, or, you know, mitigating the bias that already exists. So it's interesting and, and kind of a difficult problem. And some of the answers have brought in new, weird, ethical, existential problems. Uh, but in general, uh, no, <laughs> not really. <laughs> Thank goodness. I mean, well, and I say that because not that I'm not interested in the philosophical conversations, but sometimes it detracts from the, it, it is a way of avoiding the actual problems that exist, right, right. right? Which are, by the way, none of these are new problems. These are problems that people have, you know, the first thing you realize in any of these ethical conversations about AI is that these are the same problems that have existed in society. They're just uh, maybe more shoved in our face because they can happen faster and at scale. Right, right. I think there are, you know, there there are, I think, a range of reactions to ideas like AI and machine learning assisted hiring and, um, you know, computer vision as a kind of broad class of um, applications. And you see reactions ranging from, you know, the, you know, the technology is just a hammer. The hammer didn't kill anyone. It was the person that used the hammer that killed someone to, you know, the technology is, um, you know, the root of the evil and we should not use, you know, technology X for problem Y. Um, And I'm curious how you, you know, both how you personally kind of parse those kinds of arguments and also how you lead folks through a process to figure out, you know, what makes sense for them. Mm-hmm. This is why I really like talking to my lawyer friends. Seriously, I, I, I've no, I've actually learned a lot from from legal people. Whether it's like I thought you were about to run into a disclosure. Of- <laughs> no, no, no. I, as, as in, like you know, the, these are these are actually questions that you know they've thought of. So mm-hmm. the big question is always who has the liability. Uh, and and in some sense, when someone says, "Oh, technology is just the hammer," da da da, uh, they're kind of saying like technology is not liable, right? Or, and to, or I'm not right. liable. Right. right. Or yes. Or the, oh, you know, or I'm just the engineer, like I'm not liable, et cetera. Right. Um, and, and it's, it is an interesting conundrum, uh, even from like a, a, a legal liability perspective, like, okay, I think we can more or less agree that we can't hold an AI or a model 
liable. Um, so fine. Is it the data scientist? Is it the company? And if so, who at the company? Um, and that's not really a solved problem. Uh, I, I think there was a lot of discussion around the Uber self-driving car incident, right? Where the Uber self-driving car hit this woman on the road mm -hmm. and there was like hot potato of who's liable. So it turned out that the instruments had been tuned in a particular way that it didn't actually see her or it didn't pick her up as like a, a like a like an object moving that it should avoid if it were tuned a different way it could have by the way so i think that's a really interesting point um I know at one point they were talking about how, well, the woman driving who was the like the test driver should have been paying better attention. Uh, but, you know, one can make a pretty easy argument that if you're in an autonomous vehicle, it's really hard to be constantly paying test attention. Test designed for failure. Yeah. And just to have the level of like quick response and reaction that you need to, if you're, you know, you can't be on alert when you're not doing anything for hours at a time. So, you know, um, and I actually don't know where that, where that net is. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I'd be curious. Um, but on, you know, on, on the other end, like just, just thinking about, um, like, you know, like this, the notion of technology being neutral, like I, it's just, it's such a, again, the social science, such a silly concept, uh, because everything we build is imbued with our values, just literally just by creating something. Cause we built it in a way just to solve a problem. And sometimes I, I like to use, you know, maybe non-values laden examples. I think people get very em emotionally polarized one way or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll, I'll give you a really good example and like how I I thought about this myself. So I was in the Nordics in January and I had to go to this event and I was using like whatever maps on my phone, right? And I go outside and it's like around like negative 30 or some insane temperature, right? And like in two minutes, my phone completely bricks. Like it dies. Like I'm watching the battery go to zero and it dies. And I'm like, what's going on? And then I go to the event I'm going to and I'm like, hey, something's wrong with my phone. I'm really sorry. I'm late. Da, da, da. And they're all like, oh, yeah, yeah, that happens. Apparently, uh, at certain at, at a particular temperature and below that temperature, uh, smartphone batteries die. And mm -hmm. all you have to do, so they all, everybody has their own solutions for it. Like they have little like, they stick them in their mittens or whatever, or, um, and then also you, you, you just need to recharge it for a few minutes and it brings your battery back to full power. And I thought that was really interesting because I'm like, you know, that, that to me doesn't sound like an intractable problem. Um, but uh, if I were developing this technology in Cupertino, California, uh, where it is never below 30 degrees, I probably wouldn't see that. I probably would never have thought of that problem. Uh, as you know, something I would address. Yeah, and I thought it was really interesting that like I have a watch that knows what kind of swim stroke I'm doing, whether it's a backstroke or a butterfly or a, you know freestyle or whatever. Mm -hmm. But my my phone, the like this phone for uh, a significant population of the world, completely freezes in in a temperature that's actually not very unusual for where they are. And you know, all that is to say, like everything we build has values. We choose to prioritize certain things over others. So it's odd to say that like it's it's fundamentally like not values driven. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it, and, and yes, there are parallels to be made with like, you know, the, the, the creation of the of, uh, nuclear energy, et cetera, right? A lot of people use the Manhattan Project um, and when thinking about things like liability or responsibility. But ultimately, you know, it, it is our responsibility because we do make these things, right? And, and the things that we make are taken and used by people. And yes, we can't control how everyone's going to use what we've built. Uh, but I do think creating a culture of responsibility is absolutely critical and necessary. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think through whether that answered my question at all. Or <laughs> not. <laughs> it did not. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, and uh, you know, and, and, and I think there's an argument that you know you live in a domain to which there aren't answers to you know answers yeah. the way you know that you know there may be answers to questions that uh, you know engineers might you yeah know, and find then, and, and and I think sometimes it's fine like I, I think the the act of interrogation and the act of understanding is mm -hmm. uh, like is actually sometimes which the thing that brings you to where you want to be. Cause a lot of these things are like personal choices, right? Personal yeah. values. Um, and sometimes it's, it's hard to have these conversations because they do end up being values laden. Um, so we did this survey about a year ago at Accenture called the gray area survey. Mm -hmm. And rather than ask these like really obvious questions, like should the AI kill person A or B, they were like kind of um, uh, something that was a lot more difficult to answer. So one, uh, you know, 
one that I think was interesting was, you know, are companies responsible for not having surge pricing if there is a potential threat of a disaster? And that actually happened to me because I was in London and uh, it was crazy. I was like walking down Bond Street and then all of a sudden this flood of people come running at me. And it turns out that there, like, they, there was a scare where they thought there was somebody with a gun. It turned out to not be. But then none of us could leave because everyone was trying to get a car and uh, prices for like Ubers, et cetera, were, like absolutely insane, right? It's yeah. like 300 pounds, right? Um, but then that leads to the question, like, is, is it a company's responsibility to, to, you know, make their models such that if there's a threat of a, an attack that, you know, they don't have search, is that unsafe? Is that unfair? I don't know what the answer is to that, right? Another one would be, you know, uh, in a search engine, if you search for CEO, you're largely going to get white men uh, who are over the age of 40. Uh, is that fair or unfair? Is it ethical or unethical? You could say, well, it's the ground truth. that That's what it is. You, you know, most CEOs in the world are old white men named John, literally. Um, but or and then there's certainly an argument to be made that, you know, just because you're searching CEO doesn't necessarily mean you have to be told a biased truth. And maybe it can be more as maybe we can show images of people who are CEOs who don't fit that singular mold. And, and again, that's a values solution that that's not like there is no right answer to some of these things. And I think part of it's actually being comfortable with the fact that there are no single answers to a lot of these questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the example that was maybe floating around in the back of my mind was the, uh, I forget the name of the individual, but one of the developers of YOLO, which is a object detection library announced uh, on Twitter, hey, this computer vision thing, thing is scary, I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a, right, it was a, it was really- It was that's powerful. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the thing is, and that's the thing about a, like somebody creating a technology, absolving themselves of responsibility, it sends a message of indifference. Going back to this notion of like power structure, you know, it doesn't matter if I personally, me, Ramon, say, I don't want to use computer vision technologies, like, okay, you know, whatever. But if the person who literally created it says, you know what, like, this is not something I can like be behind anymore and I'm horrified by how this has been used, that is such a powerful message to send, you know, and, and, and it's very clear that something needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with something like that as kind of background or context, like how do you walk through, you know, personally where you draw the line or, you know, say you're an engineer at place X, you know, is, is there an answer for, you know, where I'm going, you've had this conversation yeah, yeah. hundreds of yeah, times. Yeah. Like, is it just like, you know, go off on a mountain and like, you know, sit in the position? Like <laughs> <laughs> it's tough. And like, actually, I had like a bit of a, like an existential crisis last year and thinking through exactly these decisions, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, one can arrive at the at the conclusion that inherently all capitalism is evil, right? You know, mm -hmm. This notion that there's no such thing as an ethical company. Um, and then I had this really great book uh, um, recommended to me and it's called Against Purity. Uh, it has nothing to do with ethics and AI. It actually has to do with, you know, movements that are about, you know, sort of a, a, a like a moral good um, and how this sort of uh, like this, this idea of the most pure or the most good is actually detrimental to the cause. And the author actually uses um, uh, climate change and, and the environmental movements to talk about how mm. it can be harmful if we're just trying to like out ethics each other. Uh, and, and you do right. see it sometimes, you, have to, you know, this, this idea of like, who's better than someone else because person X works at evil company Y, you know, I mean, you know, I, I can get flack because I work at Accenture, right? Does that mean that everything I do is, you know, nullified or tainted? And, you know, I, I, I don't, mm -hmm. I, I would like to think that's not the best way to approach it because frankly, you, you, you do end up in a race to the bottom, right? Where everybody has to be more ethical or more good than the other person or more pure than the other person. And it's just not a helpful, it's just not, not a helpful right. discussion. How, how ethical is it to be the ethics police that, you know, thinks they're superior to everybody? Exactly. Which actually, interestingly, like when I think about AI governance, I worry about this a lot. So again, like thinking about everything you learned about states, markets and democracy. Uh, often the way we do AI governance, like, and everyone's doing the same thing. You get a group of quote experts together. These are all like folks like me, right? And we all mm -hmm. sit in a room and we just decide what ethics is. It's very strange and problematic. And if someone were to create a government that way, we would call it an authoritarian regime. We would actually not call it a democracy. Uh -huh. uh, so it's interesting that I have seen very few 
democratic processes being built around governance. Mm. Uh, and interestingly, I think corporations would be the first ones to actually do that if they do it right. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I, I appreciate the subtitle of this book you're recommending, Against Purity, Living Ethically in Compromised Times. Mm-hmm. I think we can all relate to some yeah, aspect yeah. of that or another. Um, cool. What else? What else is going on? Anything else that we should uh, that we should be sure to cover, or any pearls of wisdom for us? Other books that we should be? Oh man! Uh, I was like literally looking at my bookshelf. I'm like, what's going on over here? Um, I don't know. What am I reading? I was reading. Actually, my laptop is like propped up on this book called The Essentials of Risk Management. Six hundred pages on a uh, financial risk management. Hard pass. <laughs> I thought, it was, I thought it was a really interesting book, like making those parallels. Uh, I tried reading Godel Escher Bach, right? It, I just, uh, it made me go to sleep. Uh, mm. It's supposed to be one of those, yeah, right here. Uh, you know, one of those classics of, you mm-hmm. know, thinking through computing, et cetera. And like, I guess I'm not smart enough for it. So I don't know. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I thought it was fine. Like the anecdotes are kind of cool, but like, I can't read like a thousand pages of like disjointed anecdotes. So it was kind of rough. Um, <laughs> I, I, I suppose like for the nth time, uh, STEM people are like, we are, are columbusing social sciences. I don't know if you, uh, uh-huh. uh, I was like, I found something today where it, it just sort of boggles my mind where, you know, entire feet, like, this whole field can just decide like, oh, wow, behavioral sciences, we are the ones who discovered it. And I'm like, oh, right, social right, sciences, we right. exist. What was uh, that example? There was something, I don't know, maybe six six months ago or something where someone wrote this article that got a lot of publicity. It was like, oh, we should have a field of study that does X, Y, Z. And yes. everyone was like, oh yeah, that exists. We've been, that, that exists. STS, we've been doing that for. <laughs> yeah, I mean, without naming names, because it, you know, like, this person is a very nice individual, uh, but I like was talking to somebody pretty high up at a major tech company leading AI, and uh, he had never heard of the field of HCI or STS. Mm. Never heard of it, but he was incredibly proud of the fact that he had just hired an ethicist to advise him. And I'm like, so you hired a philosopher to advise you, but mm-hmm. you've never heard of STS or HCI. Mm. Cool. STS being science and technology studies and HTI, human computer interaction. Yes. Uh, and that, you know, I was like, good luck with your platform. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, and the thing is like, it's, it's not to belittle the people who are trying, right? It, I think mm-hmm. that there, there is this inherent ego about tech that I just, I found like actually like mind boggling when I moved here. I, I just never been in a field where everyone just thought they were gods. I thought it was very strange, uh, but hey, I, I come from the lowly social sciences. I worked in public policy and nonprofits before, you know, I, I was an economist for a minute, you know, like mm. I just never worked in a field where literally people thought that they just did everything better than everybody else. And they say that as a data scientist, <laughs> you know, I, I just, like I said, like I didn't, I didn't understand and I still don't this mm-hmm. idea that programming is better than everything or that technology is, you know, this notion of technological solutionism. Um, and, and I think, you know, with, with, the, uh, it's, it's kind of being brought to the forefront the more we build artificial intelligence technologies, right? Like that, that we can't automate away human behavior and human preferences. And actually, um, I'd mentioned uh, Bobby, um, uh, Bobby and I have a paper on, uh, something I was working on called technological determinism and specifically thinking through recommendation systems and how they might nudge you to kind of be the same person forever. And they don't really encourage you to explore and expand your horizons simply because of the way they're constructed, right? A recommendation system takes your prior behavior, maps that, you know, who you are to a, an assessment of people who are quote like you mm-hmm. and gives you recommendations based on things you might like given other people who are profiled the same as you yeah. that to me is actually kind of scary um yeah. and, and a lot of I, conversation around this in the context of uh you know it actually the the it, it it this conversation gets more prevalent kind of every kind of political you know, election cycle, right? As we start talking about filter bubbles and and yeah. things like that, and monocultures, and yeah, like. I mean, f- filter bubbles are, are kind of a more extreme example. But I'm even thinking of like, 
I don't know. I, I think a lot. Like I, I fortunately <laughs> went to college and did all my stupid things uh, before these ways existed of tracking and tracing. Mm -hmm. God forbid there be a Facebook when I was in college for a year. <laughs> that would not be good. <laughs> Uh, but I wonder about these kids, you know, but in college, you know, back in the olden times, uh, was an interesting way to sort of reinvent yourself, right? To think of yourself mm -hmm. as like, just get like a fresh start. And and I feel like sometimes for younger people, like you can't ever escape who you are and where you're from. Uh, and you can't ever be someone else or think of the world in a different way, right? Because like you're, you'll have this weird baggage, this technological baggage with you forever. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I find that kind of sad. And I think about like how much... I have changed and how much it's part of, you know, human nature to change over time. Like we're supposed to evolve. We're supposed to be weird and different. You know, I worry a lot about the homogeneity that comes with tech. Um, and I wonder whether, you know, a social scientist or political scientist in the middle of her PhD program today could even possibly enter the field of data science. Right. Because, you know, whether or not it's because these job ad platforms um, or these, you know, these NLP based engines that match uh, resumes with jobs, which is not think I was qualified or didn't, you know, didn't know what I was doing. Or I just didn't fit some paradigm and I built my life and not fitting other people's paradigms. And I, I, I worry very much about like how people can still be individuals and be curious and just learn other things, even though the Internet has given us basically unlimited access to things i wonder if you know in a sense we may actually stifle all that possibility by thinking that like everything is this repeat cycle of behavior that we can predict patterns and these patterns are deterministic and i would say that like you know rule number one of quantitative social science is patterns exist in human behavior right rule number two is just because a pattern exists doesn't mean an individual follows it and i think rule number two hasn't really been arrived at yet in some of the fields that we're talking about mm. That seems like a good place to leave things. <laughs> we'll leave you with the big questions. <laughs> I mean, it is interesting stuff to think about, right? On a, mm -hmm. what day is today? I'm like, on a Wednesday? On a Tuesday? Friday. Fri clearly a Friday. Clear, clearly it's a Friday. Clearly I have no a Friday idea. called Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what day it is anymore, ever. <laughs> It's really hard. It, it's, I don't recall if I've talked about this in an interview, but I've independently kind of um, validated this experience for several people. Like that March was this super, super, super long month. And then April kind of flew by really quickly. Um, but time is just really weird right now. I think for time is many of us. Yeah, it's like an absolute reminder that time is absolutely relative. Although it must be great, kind of great to be a kid right now because you're in like forever summer vacation. <laughs> you know, like you're just like the longest summer ever. I know, You've got to like, be old enough to know how what you didn't have before, though, I think. Right. Otherwise, that's true. it's just that's true. Like it must be kind of cool to be like young enough that you don't really get how like, scary the situation is. Yeah. You know, but like, you're right, like old enough that you're like, oh, wow, I just get to be home for months on end and like play with my toys. And, yeah. And all yeah. that stuff it must be it must be a really interesting time. I, I do feel bad for all the kids graduating any sort of program right now. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is worse than 2008 for them. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Ruman, it was wonderful catching up with you as always. We'll have yeah, to too. make sure to uh, do it more frequently. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, thanks so much. Thank you very much for having me on, Sam. All right, everyone, that's our show for today. To learn more about today's guest or the topics mentioned in this interview, visit twimmelai.com. Of course, if you like what you hear on the podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review the show on your favorite podcatcher. Thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.